Hello and welcome. My name is Roni Firon, and this is The Bigger Picture, where we sit down with experts to hear about their journeys, their insights, and the big ideas that drive them. Stay tuned for today's episode. In today's episode, I got to speak to Professor Ghan Balkai, an archaeologist from Tel Aviv University. Archaeology is a fascinating field that provides us with a very real, physical, sensory connection with our past. By uncovering certain objects, remnants, and markings left behind by prehistoric man, we can paint a picture of what the life of our early ancestors was really like. Each new discovery adds to this tapestry of history and the new technological advancements we have today help make our estimations of the past even more accurate. One of the exciting discoveries that Ghan and his team have found is that of cave paintings that were so deep within the caves that the prehistoric humans that ventured in there must have used fire to light their way. What Ghan and his colleagues were able to show was that at such depths, due to the lack of circulation, Lighting a fire would cause oxygen levels to lower to such a degree that a state of epoxia would be induced in these early painters. In other words, early humans were no strangers to altered states of consciousness. They would enter these trance-like states in which they would embark on spiritual journeys and paint on the cave walls. We spoke about the possible meanings behind these cave paintings and Ghan's ideas on how these altered states of consciousness were intentional and deliberate and were used by prehistoric man to expand their awareness, call forth insights, and ultimately to find solutions to different existential problems they may have been facing. We ventured into some Jungian territory in this episode as well, discussing how, in the psyche of early man, there was much less distinction between the subject and the object, or the internal world and the external world. Early humans were most likely much more in tune with their environments. There always remains the question, though, of whether or not we're romanticizing the past and wishfully projecting characteristics onto early humans, such as their heightened awareness and respect for nature and strong sense of community. We can only do the best we can in painting this picture of the life of our early ancestors. But I believe that even if we are romanticizing certain elements of our history— This longing for simpler times, in which we were more connected with nature, family, and community, can help shed light on precisely those elements that we are most hungry for today in our modern world. Whether or not prehistoric man lived an idyllic life of peace and quiet, strong family bonds, and a felt sense of oneness with the world around him, we may never be 100% certain of. And archaeologists like Ghan do an extraordinary job at following the facts and helping paint the most accurate picture with the tools we have available. Nevertheless, this picture can help to show us what the important things in life really are. That is, being at peace with ourselves, belonging to a community, and living in harmony with the planet we find ourselves on. And now, I hope you enjoy today's conversation with Professor Ghan Balkai. Hi, Ran. Welcome to The Bigger Picture, and thank you for coming to speak with us today. Hi. Actually, you came to speak to me. <laughs> we are at my, my place at the university, so thank you for coming. And it's a pleasure to have you here with us and all the, all the vessels and stone tools and everything. Absolutely. It's a mm-hmm. pleasure to be here. So, you are a professor of prehistoric archaeology at Tel Aviv University, and you've been exploring the question of how prehistoric humans lived throughout your career. And most recently, you published a book along with your colleague, Eyal Khalfon. And can you tell us what this book is about? Yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a new book, as you said. It was just, just released at the end of May, just two weeks ago. And we've been working on that during the, through the last year of the of the COVID nineteen uh, virus, which was good for us because it 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 kept us working. It's a book about uh, it's first of all it's a book for the general public. It's not a book for professionals. It's not a book for archaeologists. Uh, uh, it's for archaeologists and professionals as well. But it's for it's for, it's it's for the general public, and it it presents 
1.5 million years of human presence in Israel, in the Levant where we live. And th- we took a journey through 10 archaeological sites in Israel, uh, almost within a walking distance from one, one to the other. And we paint the picture of human presence of, of 1.5 million years here in the Levant uh, with the changes that took place, with the different human groups that came here, with the different things that happened. And we show how human uh, evolution, cultural and biological evolution, took place here where we live now for the past 1.5 million years. Uh, and, and we show how rich this area is in prehistoric sites and how it, it, it really documents the very long history of the human race just where we live now, which is amazing. And not everyone is aware of this fact. Amazing. The fact that it's, there's so much rich soil to discover here and there are so many findings here. Not only rich soil, but mostly rich archaeological research. I mean, there is a rich soil everywhere in the, fer- in the Fertile Crescent. But where we live in, in modern Israel, modern day the Israel, there are not only plenty of, of archaeological sites, but archaeological research is so deep and, and, and is going on for over 100 years. So we know much more than we know of, of, of almost any, any other piece of Earth on the planet. So this is a laboratory of prehistoric archaeology. So it's not only the sites, it is mostly the work of the archaeologists and the combination of, of the two, which makes this place unique. Now, you have been using this term prehistoric, right? And I wanted to ask, what exactly is prehistory? When does history begin for us? Well, I will start from the bottom and I will say what, what prehistory is not. It's not about the dinosaurs. Every once in a while, a student comes and he wants to study about the dinosaurs. Well, we don't deal with the dinosaurs. Well, maybe with human dinosaurs, uh, but, but not with, re- with real dinosaurs. Basically, prehistory begins when human, humans emerge in Africa about three million years ago. And it ends when writing begins, when humans start to write. And this happens in different parts of the world, but only a few thousand years ago. So prehistory has a long chronological range from the, from the appearance of, of the human race, which emerged out of some kind of chimpanzees or something, a missing link in between some million years ago, and until humans began writing. History begins with written sources, and this happens here in the Levant about 5,000 years ago. So prehistory is everything between the beginning of writing and and the emergence of of the human race again it encapsulates some some three million years in the Levant about one point five million years as far as we know now okay and are you guys solely concerned with homo sapiens or are you also concerned with hominids beforehand we we are concerned with everything which is human and and the chimpanzees are a bit human human as well, but they don't live what we call material culture. Uh, they do, but but to some extent. Uh, we start when when the emergence of humans and culture begins, when humans begin to to produce uh, tools, stone tools, other kind of tools, when they when when they first established what we call an archaeological site, and we're dealing with with all sorts of humans, not only Homo sapiens, but mostly with the, with the early ancestors of Homo sapiens. Again, it depends on what period one, one deals with. I was dealing uh, for many years with the Neolithic, which is a later time period, of course, belong to Homo sapiens. But in the last 20, 30 years, I'm dealing with the, with the ancestors of, of Homo sapiens, mostly with a with the, with the species called Homo erectus, which, which was here before Homo sapiens. Now, I wanted to ask you, what made you fall in love with prehistory and archaeology? Well, it's, 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 it's an issue. <laughs> uh, and and I, tell, I, tell this, I tell this to my students right away. I, 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 I was always interested in history, in, in the past, let's say. The past always interests me as, 
as a young boy, I remember I was looking in encyclopedias and so on near my bed about the Romans and the Egyptians and so on and uh, and, uh, and 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 ancient things in Israel and so on, but I was not not particularly interested in a specific period or topic. Uh, and and when I uh, uh, finished my army service and I decided that I want to go to to study something it was it was clear to me that I want to study archaeology without any particular explanations my parents were very much disappointed with me of my choice they didn't understand the, uh, why why I'm doing that regardless of the fact that they knew that we spent a lot of time outside hiking and I was always interested in in stones and I was always finding stuff since my early childhood so for me it was natural for them not so but 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 uh, uh, as a matter of fact my main interest when I came to study was the pyramids I was fascinated by the pyramids the pyramids in Egypt uh, I went to Egypt before I before I began to study and 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 watch the pyramids for for days and everything that had to do with ancient Egypt and so on so my 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 major concern was in the past and my and my focus of interest when I started was was the pyramids and ancient Egypt so I came here and studied about ancient Egypt and the pyramids and hieroglyphs and so on and it was very interesting but as soon as I came into this specific room where we sit and I took the class of prehistoric stone tools and prehistoric stone tools were spread on the table and were attaching them and learning about them it was clear to me that this is what I want to do I had a special connection with stone tools with flint tools when I touched them when I when I when I when I analyzed them it was it was love at first sight or or sense so it's something which goes beyond the uh, uh, logic, I guess, but, but uh, as soon as I started touching, learning, excavated stone tools, I realized this is what I want to do. I realized that, that, that it speaks to me in a different way. I can, I can understand it. I, 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 I can sense it. It's a, it's a central thing. So I came here for, for other purposes, but as soon as I came across stone tools, it was clear to me from first touch that that this is what I want what what I want to do, and I had uh, I was a good student, and I had propositions from other fields of study in archaeology, but it was clear to me that I want to do prehistory. So so amazing. I think there's something you know you said it goes beyond logic. Where when you find your passion, it isn't exactly a rational event. There's something in it that just calls to you, and you know it all of a sudden. It's even not a passion. I mean, it is, it is, it's, as I said, it's something sensual. I, I sense that there's something there which I can understand beyond logic, beyond academy, beyond. Uh, uh, um, and there's a direct sensory connection to the past in a way, right? Through these absolutely, tools. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I realized very early that, that the, that the information which is hidden within the stone tools can be available to me uh, in a scale which is which is different than 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 other things and and other people and this goes until this day i mean i mean there's something special in the connection between me and stones and 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 it goes beyond the beyond logic or be, or beyond the learning or, or it's in addition to that so, so in this room, I found my, my, not my destiny, but, but, but the material which I got, I got connected to. Beautiful. Now we, we spoke of stone tools. One of the things that you guys have been looking at is how stone tools have been evolving throughout history in terms of the, the different uses and functions that the stone tools served, right? So one of the things that you found is that humans from over hunting we have basically made megafauna very large animals for instance elephants we've made them go instinct and you can see this from the development of stone tools well it's a it's a it's a complicated issue uh first we are hesitant about using terms like evolved or developed because why because in our perspective, this is a kind of, of, of a moral judgment that we, that we put on early humans. So we, we, we rather used more, more uh, uh, neutral terms like changed. 
Okay. Because there's no, uh, no argument that stone tools change with time. Uh, it, was, it was used to be conceived as a development, but I'm not sure this is the case, and I'll explain why. First of all, we should start and say that, that according to what we know, humans started using stone tools uh, uh, during the process of, of a change from, from apes to humans, and it goes hand in hand with the change in diet. Once humans went uh, 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 down the trees and lived in a savanna-like environment, they moved to walk on two legs and they changed their, their, their diet with the, with the diet available in a, in a savanna. Uh, in concert with that, they uh, uh, went through all kinds of changes. Mostly their brain grew bigger. They, their hands became free because they... they they walked on two legs, and they started to started to uh, to manipulate stone in order to make stone tools, and they made stone tools in order to process uh, uh, process animal carcasses. So this is when when all started this 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 uh, uh, this connection between human human anatomy, human diet, and human technology. So it started some three some three million years ago in in in. Africa, and it changes through time. And these, these changes are documented, but are hardly understood. They are mostly understood as a process of development leading to Homo sapiens. But this is, in my view, part of the human uh, superiority complex or the sapiens superiority complex that we have. We believe that we are the, we are the crown of creation and everything led to us. And, and everything on the way was steps leading to us. I think that when you look at prehistory through deep time, you see a different picture. You see human species which were not inferior to us and had their own lifestyle and they deserve their respect. So going back to your question, as I see it, stone tools are connected to the types of animals that were available and humans were making toolkits that were perfectly adaptable to the animals that they hunted and ate. And I see the changes in stone tools as a reflection of the changes in animals that were, that were available to humans that were living in this particular place. And we know that there were changes in animal availability as well in tandem with changes in the stone tools. But unfortunately, in archaeology, uh, finds are divided between specialists. And one person studies flint tools or stone tools, and another person is studying animal bones. And in rare cases, people put these data sets together. When we put these data sets together, we try to provide an explanation for the changes in stone tools, which are not directional towards being better, but could be explained as a better adaptation to the animals that were available at that time. This is a long explanation to your question. So, so we can suggest, we suggest that these changes could be explained by the extinction of different animals in different time, meaning that people were dependent on a specific animal taxa. Once this animal taxa became extinct or disappeared, we don't know exactly why, but we believe that humans were a major agent in the disappearance of these taxa. People had to change their, their, their toolkit to fit the next big animal that was available. So we, so we suggest a correlation between the animals that people hunted, the, the, the disappearance of these animals, and the changes in stone tools. Okay, so there is something in that, what you said. The fact that we modify our environment and then have to evolve or to change and to better adapt to this modified environment that kind of resonates for me with what's happening today, right? We have developed all sorts of technologies where we're not quite, um, we haven't throughout human evolution, we haven't really been adapted to deal with this information age, for instance. And, there's almost a call to to evolve in that direction now, right? To better adapt to our environment. And there's from from what you were saying, 
the, that this basically is a pattern that has been around forever uh, in human history. I believe so. I believe so. But again, it's a matter of pace and, 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 and the scale of time means a lot. Uh, uh, basically, what, what, I, what I think, what I believe is, what I claim is, is that actually people were cutting the branch they were sitting on uh, as, as the human race began, began its, its, its appearance on the planet. We are a derived ape and we are different and we behave differently and people from the beginning of 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 time of the human race as i said as i said were cutting the branch they were sitting on uh, very very slowly at some periods uh, much faster now but yes we are modifying we are modifying our environment we are using the environment to scale which is which the environment cannot regenerate and again this was done since human appears appeared on this planet but again in a different scale there were there were there were periods where where the planet could sustain human existence to some extent but each and every time like a cycle like history history repeat itself every once in a while there was there was drama there was a, a, a an end to the previous mode of adaptation because uh, something went out of out of use okay so the way you speak about uh, prehistory in terms of you know cutting off the branch that we were sitting on there is an implication in that that in prehistory we lived better lives in a sense that we that the lives that a uh, the prehistoric man lived uh, are better than we have today. Right. And we also kind of touched upon that in terms of evolution might not be the right word. Well, again, it's a matter of perspective in my perspective, in my perspective, uh, the answer is yes. This is what, what, what I can understand of, of what I learned about human life in the past. And it might sound romantic. Uh, I'm not ashamed of being romantic sometime, uh, my wife uh, says that I'm not, I'm not romantic enough, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, yes, it's a bit romantic. But again, it is based on 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 what I can learn from the deep past of 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 the human race. Uh, uh, life was not easy, but if someone believes that life now is easy, I have an argument with him. Uh, uh, life was was uh, was different. Again, many people believe that people didn't last long in the past that that that, that uh, uh, they they died at an at an at an early age uh, maybe yes maybe not i'm not sure i think the question is what was the quality of life and in my opinion the quality of life was was very different than the way we live and and in my opinion at least i know that there there are many people who think otherwise it was much more relaxed much more uh, humble much more connected with the world and much more connected with other people so so yes in my opinion the quality of life was 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 better than what than what we experience now there definitely is you know a lot of there are a lot of voices that are speaking to the progress that we've been making as, um, you know, as humanity where poverty levels, um, are, you know, there's less poverty overall and all sorts of these different, uh, technological advancements, less, uh, uh, death and childbirth, all sorts of these kind of statistics that we use, but not many people address the ailments of modernity, right? That there's very specific, costs that I don't think that I think that are often overlooked I totally agree I believe we are victims of modernity and vi- and victims of, of of the system that we live in of course uh, those who live in the in the in the capitalistic system uh, uh, above all uh, yes there are advantages there is air condition there is food in the supermarkets and so on but I think there are many many downsides mostly on the on the social scale with trust between people and 
collaboration between people and 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 peace and quiet i mean we 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 lack peace and quiet and i think that peace and quiet is the is the major advantage we know that hunter gatherers enjoy a lot of peace and quiet a lot of spare time a lot of time a lot of time most time is devoted to social interactions to experience the landscapes to to wandering around we are too oriented towards doing things all the time and i think that the level of pressure that we are experiencing was never experienced in the past of course there is a pressure when you are attacked by a cyber tooth tiger of course and this happened in the past uh, i think that they knew how to deal with it it's not like our fear from from tigers Uh, uh, of course, when you try to hunt an elephant, it's a scary event. But I think that they had relationships with the elephants then that, that, that make this uh, uh, not as scary as we can imagine. And, and mostly, I think that they, they had to trust each other. Uh, they had to keep, to keep autonomy of, of each other. Uh, uh, They had to get along with each other throughout time, otherwise it wouldn't have worked. We wouldn't have been here if they wouldn't have found a way to get along with each other peacefully. So I think that we lack that. We, we don't trust each other enough. We trust only only ourselves or, or, the, or the machines that we invent. And I think the trust and, and getting along and keeping the autonomy of each Of others were basic elements in human prehistory and in my opinion this is why the human race lasted for the last three million years and since we don't keep these traits anymore uh, uh, we'll have to invent uh, uh, much more elements in order to to keep to keep the human race alive I definitely agree with you that there are certain elements that we've lost touch with. For instance, the sense of community is very much lacking today. The peace and quiet that we don't really have, right? We're f- from morning to, uh, to evening, we're always, you know, with our phones and bombarded by um, social media posts and emails and all sorts of things like that. But I wonder if, it's, if it's right to say that we don't have any more trust or cooperation at all because I think – Just walking down the street it's a miracle that you know we are able to live in a society where most of us are strangers and n- not that much crime happens right <laughs> relatively speaking we do live in a peaceful society so there are elements that we have been able to preserve but I think you know what you were talking about is this sense of a cohesive community the sense of knowing each other and to Um, having a deeper trust for the people who are around you absolutely absolutely and more than that I totally agree with you I think that human nature is good I think there is a there is a good uh, spark in everyone and and I think that this spark was much more active in prehistory it could be activated again no doubt but modern manipulation is In many cases uh, uh, put the spark away or or put it down uh, uh, I think that humans are wonderful creatures they have excellent capabilities they proved that in the past it, it could happen again uh, but again it takes it takes work it takes consciousness it takes it takes uh, uh, many many things to to regenerate that but I totally agree with you and It is within every one of us we can we can we can be like that again uh, I think that the system works against this in many cases but but I totally think that I'm I'm totally uh, uh, I'm not pessimistic about about the human race I think that the human race uh, has many many good sides and and if people will be aware of this of these good sides then It can be it can be enlarged it can be life can be better no doubt I'm happy to hear you say that because you know a lot of times you hear people talking about uh, the environmental crisis for instance and they talk about humanity as literally you know they've I've, I've heard people say hu- humans are cancer upon the earth right and I think there's something 
too negative about that, where it's almost um, a self-flagellation kind of a, of a philosophy. And I think what you're saying is that there is a spark of good in everyone. And I think it's true that there is a positive and a negative potential within all of us. And we need to be very aware of both of them. I totally agree with you. It's a, it's a matter of awareness. We should be aware of what we do. We should be aware of the effect that our doings are causing the planet and we can do much better. We can do much better and it's only a matter of, of being aware of that. So we touched upon a few elements, but what other lessons can we learn from prehistoric man about the good potential that exists in us? Well, uh, many, many lessons. As I said before, people were uh, 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 inventing things throughout time. Humans are really good in inventing things, in technology, in manipulating things. We are very good in that. And this is this has, has a, long, a long history. People were always good in that. People were always good in... Well, well we guess that, that, that necessity is the mother mother of invention. And there were necessities throughout time and people were ingenuine. They, they found beautiful solutions to very complex problems from the start. This is something that is embedded within us. I don't know how, but something in the way our brain is working and, and our hands are, are, are manipulating things and this, and this connection between the hand and the brain and, and stuff is, is something that is embedded within us, and we're very good in that. People were were collaborating throughout time. We're working together. Working together is especially is especially important. People, as we as we understand, or at least as I understand, were paying respect to everything throughout time. They were paying respect to other people. They're paying they're paying respect to different elements in the world. They were behaving in a respectful way. And again, it's a, matter of, it's a matter of awareness, but I think that if we can gain this respect back or behave in a respectful way towards everything on the planet, life will be better. This is, I think, if you want, uh, uh, the most important lesson that I can find is respectful behavior, is paying respect to everything around us, not only to humans, first and for all, for humans, but not only for humans, for for everything on the planet. And if you ask me what is the most dominant element that kept the human race surviving, I think it's respect. I think that's a very powerful statement because it's, first of all, having respect for other people and for the different elements of nature. It There's something in that that opposes uh, rampant individualism, right? It realizes that you are embedded in a network, not only of a community, but also that you are a part of nature. And it teaches you to not take for granted, you know, the world that you've been born into. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, we can find evidence, at least I can find evidence, that people were... uh, paying respect to, to stones, to animals, to water, to mountains, to caves. Can you of, give us some course, examples of, course, of that? Of course, to, 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 to other people as well. But, but again, there is, there is a pattern of behavior. And, and there's a reason why we find specific things at specific places. For example, we know that humans were mining stone, extracting stone from deep sources for at least half a million years. But we also know that they were caching specific items at specific places. They were giving back things to the earth. They were choosing the places where they mined the stones carefully in order to, to preserve stone resources, stone resources for next generations. They were, they were acting in a respectful way, both towards what they were using and towards future use of these what we call resources i don't call it resources because i think for them it was not a resource it was an element in nature so so we can find evidence that they were uh, uh, acting in a in a respectful behavior and in some cases we can see that they wasted nothing 
I think that nothing is wasted was a mantra in prehistoric times. Uh, uh, it makes sense. They wasted nothing. They used every piece of stone, every piece of bone. They took it to the limit. They, they treated it with respect and they made every use possible of every item. And we have evidence of recycling stone from, again, at least half a million years ago. And we live here in Israel in, in the land of, of milk, honey, and stone. There is stone <laughs> all over the place. There were, at no time there were shortage in stone. But they treated stone like it is going to be extinct. And they recycled everything they could, and they left us a lot of stone. And, and they used every piece of the hunted animal. And again, this was done, at least in my opinion, on purpose, because they, because they, because they respected these elements that they were dependent uh, upon. In this case, mostly stone and animals. And, and they, in my opinion, they had a sense that they are <clears throat> using these elements maybe too much. They wanted to, to preserve it for, for, for long. Mostly, I believe they wanted the world to keep on existing the way they know it. And in my opinion, nothing is wasted is a major element in this, in this context. And in our modern time, we are, we are very far from nothing is wasted. We waste so much. Right. And I think that comes from a disconnection with reality in a sense. We're disconnected from nature and we don't, we're very removed from the sources from which we get all of our supplies, right? Everything that we use on a daily basis, we don't really realize where it's coming from. Absolutely. And what is the cost of it and where, and where it came from. And, and, and even if you try to explain this to people, this is very difficult. Yes, I agree. It's, 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 it's a major obstacle. But again, at least with the students that I work with and they come from Western society and, and with different habits and so on. And, and I feel that these concepts find way to their heart. So I think that this, this, the understanding of this, of these elements of this, of this uh, uh, way of behavior is, is within every, every one of us. And once we came to, we come to acknowledge its importance. It's, it's, it's the way it supported our ancestors. Uh, uh, it is, it is easy to be accepted. It is not easy to be executed because we, we live in, in modern society. But, but I think that maybe step by step, one of the reasons I'm doing prehistoric archaeology is because I believe it, it, it presents a perspective about the human race. And this is one of the lessons of this perspective. If we want to survive, if we want to keep the planet, there are certain elements that we should keep. And, and I think that these elements are, are clearly understood. I think one of the things that you said before of the fact that we are able to advance technology and to think up, you know, new, new tools and new, uh, new ways of being where there's an important distinction there that we made before that it's not always necessarily progressing in a positive direction. And we need to be very conscious of the direction that we're, we're evolving towards, right? Or the kinds of technologies that Absolutely. we're developing. As I said, we, we went maybe one step too far. If I said before that, that necessity was the mother of invention and we find in, in prehistory times where conservatism was the name of the game, people didn't change much throughout tens of thousands of years. And these are periods of prosperity. These are periods where human, where human adaptation was perfectly fitted with the environment. So I believe that in the past people stayed with anchors that worked. And once there was a need, they changed. In modern times, change is the name of the game. In, in, in many, many aspects, we change for the cause of change. I mean, if something is not changing in technology, we feel that something is wrong. 
we champion progress as if it's the virtue, the ultimate virtue. Absolutely. And, and, and we have the feeling that if we don't feel this progress happening within our lifetime, within our daily lifetime, something is wrong. And in prehistory, as I said, conservatism or people or periods of time when things haven't changed because they were perfectly fit with the needs, these are periods that we should learn from. And, and we shouldn't champion only progress and only innovation. We are good in that. But we should keep that to times of need. This is my opinion. Uh, but, but, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm considered a kind of a dinosaur in this respect. I wanted us to talk about one of your other findings where you guys looked at cave paintings that were very deep in the cave, which meant that the prehistoric humans had to be using fire in the cave to see. And that would mean that from the smoke, they were oxygen deprived. So one of the conclusions that you guys made from that is that they must have been in a state of hypoxia. Right, an yes. altered state of consciousness. Absolutely. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, again, it's a it's a long story. Uh, uh, in some parts of the world, prehistoric people were painting paintings or making depictions within caves. Uh, this happens mostly with with Homo sapiens. It started about forty, fifty thousand years ago, and it was always considered. Only, only a quality of Homo sapiens, which was, which was artistic, which create museums, which done something that people have not done, done previously. Most of these depictions are within deep and dark caves, and no one has really dealt with the question why Homo sapiens were doing these depictions in deep and dark caves. Most scholars were satisfied with the fact that it's only Homo sapiens. It's very beautiful. It's very nice. It's a symbol of, of us. We were artists. We had a touch with, 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 uh, with uh, symbolism and museums while, while other people too, uh, while earlier people had not. And this is the basic concept even until now. We approach this, this issue from a different angle that has to do first with the connections with people and animals because most of these depictions are depictions of animals, which were depicted within deep and dark caves, mostly large animals, mammoths, uh, rhinos, uh, buffaloes, uh, uh, deers, and so on. Uh, so I'm interested in, in the relationships between people and, and, and animals for a long time. And I'm interested in the relationships between people and caves for a very long time, because as you, as you mentioned, uh, we work under the assumption that, that people were connected to nature in a different way than we do. So we see caves as portals to the underground. In many indigenous societies nowadays, and not only indigenous societies, if you will think about, about religious societies nowadays, they have a special connections with the sky or with, or with the world beyond. So we work under the assumption that prehistoric people were had special connections with, with the worlds underneath, with the underworld and the world beyond. And we see through a lot of studies that we went through, uh, we see caves as, as a portal, as a gate to the underworld, to the, to the, to the world beyond. So we connected these elements, uh, uh, animals, cave and prehistoric people, together with our study of the use of fire, which is another element which is important. We haven't talked about that, but, but the human, a love story with fire is again is a is again a, a, a very a very a very interesting subject. So we're studying human uses of fire within a cave. There is a cave that I'm excavating. It is called Kesem Cave, and and at Kesem Cave there are evidence for the early earliest use of fire for roasting meat. It took place four hundred thousand years ago in the Levant here in Israel. But this is this is. A different story, I'm just explaining how we combine all these elements together. And then we realized that in order to make these depictions in these deep and dark caves, people had to use fire. And there were actually evidence of the use of torches within these caves. So people entered these caves with torches in order to make these depictions. And they went to the deepest, darkest places of the caves with torches in order to make depictions. We realized that the use of fire reduces the amount of oxygen within a cave. So we stimulated the use of, of 
torches within these caves, and we reached the conclusion that it reduces the amount of oxygen to a level which caused hypoxia in this case, which is altered state of consciousness. Altered states of consciousness or trance or whatever you, you call it are universally used among indigenous societies in order to get connected with the different parts of the cosmos. So we suggested to put all these elements together and suggest that these depictions were created as a consequence of altered states of consciousness, which were, were, were purposely conducted within these caves. We believe that prehistoric humans were capable of understanding everything at least as good as us or maybe better. So they realized that once they enter a cave, which again for them we believe was conceived as a portal to the underground, that once that they entered caves with torches, they went through an altered state of consciousness and they became connected with different realms of the world. And we think that this has to do with what they depicted within this context, which is, again, it's a novel interpretation, but we think that this has to do with, with the more general universal behavior, which is usually termed as, as, as shamanism as persons who, who whom their their role is to solve problems by getting connected to the different worlds, the 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 the, the underworld or the upper world. And we suggest that these caves again were their way to connect to the underworld. And to find solutions to all kinds of problems. As I said, we think that people means were oriented towards finding solutions to problems. Incredible. Incredible. There's a lot of things in there that I'd like to touch upon. First of all, it's nice to know that we are not the only uh, era of humanity that has been um, playing around with altered states of consciousness and that it's something that goes way back. They were not playing around. They were not. This is the difference. <laughs> they were not playing it wasn't around. wasn't recreational. They were not getting high or getting stoned. They went through altered state of consciousness, and altered state of consciousness is not a good term. It's a modern term. We should say they widened their consciousness in a way. Again, but they were doing that not to get away from reality, but in order, I believe in their perception, to get connected with entities that could solve problems that they were confronting. Okay, so there's another thing in that where you said... It, we shouldn't call it an altered state of consciousness. And I agree. I think for them experientially, most likely it was literally entering a portal, right? Because there is the physical change of going deep down into the cave with the fire and the complete change in consciousness. There is an element of entering a different world. Absolutely. And you can go through changes in your in your consciousness, even without the use of fire in a cave. Once you get isolated, you get deprived from all your senses. Uh, like sensory deprivation tanks that uh, we have today. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, in many indigenous societies, people who want to, to experience widening their consciousness, they deprive themselves of food, for example, before they enter the cave. And there all the senses are changing. So, so this is... A, a, a very complicated process and 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 fire is maybe uh, the last element which is used in order to to go through this if you wish vision quest but it's a whole package of entering a cave depriving yourself from the from the outer space from light from 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 sight uh, it's the set and setting, if you will. It's entering a different world. Right. Absolutely. And I, and I want to return to the problem solving element. But from everything that we've been talking about, this very much relates to me to Carl Jung's work on on the evolution of consciousness, really. And his his view of what he calls primitive man. Right. And we'll, we're going to call prehistoric man. Absolutely. <laughs> That one of the things that he noted is that the psyche of the prehistoric man was very much externalized, right? There wasn't so much this distinction between subject and object that we have today. 
and that they're part of you know what you're saying about this connection to nature to the world around us to the people around us that there was something that was less separate between us and our experiences and the world around us i totally agree yes uh, uh, academically it's not re- really easy to 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 demonstrate that with archaeology but again from from what i can see i i connect very good to to jung's theory mostly from for for the concept of of archetypes and the kind of the fact that the human race carries with it knowledge and concepts f- from the past uh, like our our common consciousness right our collective unconscious our collective unconsciousness yeah th- this is this is a concept i i i i i I can easily get get attached with because we find many many elements that repeats in different cultures in different times which have no other explanation but a, but a neurological one which 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 is common to all humans this, these are these are these are universal consonants which appear in different times in different places and again can be only explained by something neurological that we see within our vision I totally agree. Right. For instance, the cave paintings that you guys found, similar cave paintings have been found in different parts of the world. But I wanted to return to this idea of fire deep within a cave and a connection to the underworld. And you, when you realize that these things go way back and have repeated over um, such vast periods of human history that you... It's, it becomes very clear where this idea of heaven and hell came from and the way we depict it, right? Now, there is the, the obvious issue of um, the positive element of heaven and the negative element of hell, and we're not going to go into that, but just the symbology of it, just the, the picturing of, of these landscapes. Yes, in a way, I believe that throughout time, human... Uh, uh, acknowledge the existence of 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 beneficial parts of the cosmos and dangerous parts of the cosmos and you can name it name them the way you wish and and i think that they got attached to 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 these two to these two worlds or to these two these two parts of the cosmos and they were aware of the fact that there are elements that can work for them and elements that can work against them and i think that they were in contact within these elements throughout time. Now I wanted to return to this idea of problem solving and using these shamanic states to to widen our consciousness in order to be able to... First of all, there's, there's a few things that happen in an altered state of consciousness where you are per, perceptive to more information than you were previously and also you're able to put together information um, and consolidate information in a way that you weren't able to previously to, to come up with novel solutions. Is there, is there anything else in this experience that you think helped them problem solve? Uh, There was a lot, there was a lot, but I'm not, I'm I'm not sure that my consciousness is, 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 is ready to, to comprehend all that. I think that at least my consciousness is, is too narrow to really understand that. I can tell you that from what we learn about about indigenous societies and about people who who experience widening their consciousness today is that these things that you mentioned uh, uh, are happening and people within their mind are able to get attached to to different uh, knowledge to different solutions to different things to understand things better again i know it it sounds weird to to those who are not aware of that but i think that within our our, our box within our mind uh, there are many more possibilities than what we are using and i believe that by widening their consciousness people were able to get attached to areas in their mind and maybe in, in, in other realms that, that we are not attached to. I know it sounds a bit psyche, but, but uh, uh, I truly believe uh, this, this can happen. 
And, and I believe that we're doing that. Indigenous societies are doing that even until today for, again, solving all kinds of problems, starting with health issues and ending with, with making rain and, and finding all kinds of solutions to all different problems. And if you believe the stories and I believe the stories, it works. So there are, there are other ways to solve problems than the way we are using and and I'm not advocating advocating using a, 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 a using materials that will uh, expand or widen your consciousness. I think this is this is doable even without that. Right, and I th- I wanted to to answer that idea of you know it might sound a bit psyche, but I think there's first of all something about altered states of consciousness that there's an inherent mysteriousness that's built in because you're connecting to things that are usually um, inaccessible to you, right? You are supernatural, if you wish. Right. Whichever way you, you want to, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use or whatever way you want to conceptualize it. But really there is the realm of the unknown things that aren't accessible to us. And these altered states of consciousness allow us to access these different uh, realms or this different information or this, you know, different uh, modes of problem solving, whatever way you want to to call it. So there is that built in mysteriousness in it. And I think another element that's really important to mention is that, and this is also something that comes from Carl Jung's work, the shamanic instinct or the religious instinct or the spiritual instinct is a fact of human reality, right? The fact that it might be uh, abstract and not easily comprehended through our empirical lens, it is something that pops up over and over again in human history. I agree. As you know, in academy, uh, uh, this is not uh, very much accepted because most of my colleagues are not following this line of thinking. Uh, uh, of course, there are religious academics, which, which again, find, find, uh, uh, find solutions in, in, in other places. But most academics I'm, I'm familiar with are non-religious and are working under the assumption that there, was n- there is nothing beyond our understanding. I don't feel like that. And I, again, I can tell you what, from what I can learn from the human past, from my perspective on human prehistory, people until modern time were always experiencing widening their, 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 their consciousness. And they were always looking for a connection to all kind of, of super, super natural things, which again, in their, uh, Perception were a, 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 a part of the world. And again, for example, we, when we excavated Kesem Cave, we found a wing of a swan, which was brought to the cave 400,000 years ago. And this wing of a swan had cut marks on it. And this is a part of a swan which has nothing to eat on it. It has only the feathers. So it is clear that 400,000 years ago, people brought a swan or a swan wing to the cave and extracted the feathers from the wing. This is clear. And there is no reason to extract the feathers from the wing, but to do something with the wings, with the, with the, with the feathers. And feathers and birds in general are a connecting agent to the upper worlds in all cultures, in all time, throughout time. People always wanted to fly up high and to reach the skies again in order to get attached to the entities that they believed uh, were uh, uh, living there. So we have evidence at Kesem Cave 400,000 years ago that people went for the feathers of a swan. And again, there is no practical reason to go for feathers of swans. And there are uh, uh, plenty of archaeological evidence throughout time that demonstrated that birds and especially uh, feathers, were an element to get connected with the entities which were up there. So if you uh, follow closely archaeological research, you can 
demonstrated that elements of shamanism were were present there throughout time amazing this also this idea of you know the feather and the bird and being connected to the higher world there's also something that relates to this externalization of our psyche right where I think the symbology of a bird or feathers as being connected to flight or to transcendence or to spirit for instance air is something that was very much a part and parcel of their uh, their experience the prehistoric humans that we have almost kind of internalized the symbology absolutely and again this this connects very well to the respect I was speaking about before because in Every piece of the cosmos, even stones, I go back to stones, stones were, were respected because they came from the bottom of the earth and they were, in their conception, the earlier, earlier, earlier uh, inhabitants of the, of the planet. So for them, this was, this was a connection to the, to the earlier worlds and to the underworld and so on. So, so birds the same and, 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 and other animal taxa and trees and water and mountain peaks. I mean, we found extraordinary archaeological evidence at mountain peaks. And again, there's no other reason for getting attached to, to, to the higher parts of the world. So it's all... One big parcel, as you say. Now, I wanted to ask, why do you think they were depicting these larger animals specifically? Well, I will start by saying that there's no explanation why. And many of my colleagues claim that we shouldn't ask ourselves why. I mean, many of my colleagues say we will never know the answer. And, and I find this a bit radical. Because if this is the the end, we'll never know the story. I'm not interested in the details if there's no ability to know the story, what is behind it. so so I'm looking for an answer to the question why? This is the question that 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 is at the base of my interest. Uh, uh, I'll tell you a long story short. Uh, I work under the under the assumption. that they were depicting the animals that were disappearing from the world. I mean, uh, there was a time of crisis. We know that about 40,000 years ago, there was, there was the fifth mass, mass extinction. Uh, larger animals were disappearing from the world. Uh, mammoths, rhinos, uh, cattle became less and less available. And I believe that they were, they, they were confronting animals A, a kind of a crisis when the animals that were that they were dependent upon for survival for hundreds of, of, of thousands of years were disappearing from the world or becoming uh, in short supply and I believe that they went to the deepest parts of the caves in order to get attached to the underworld which is the place of prosperity where things come from like water like animals and so on. And I believe they went there in order to cry out loud the disappearance of these animals in hope to regain them, to, to make them come again. We know, for example, that they were extracting animal bones within cracks at the depth of the cave. At the depth of the cave, there are cracks, and these cracks are, are conceived among indigenous societies today as, as entry points for, To the, to the world beyond, to the, to the underworld, to the netherworld. And I think they were looking for a place to convey the message, we lack these animals. We know that at this time, they were no longer hunting and processing this kind of taxa because they were not around anymore. So at least in my vision, I vision that in their world, wide states of consciousness, they were visioning these kind of animals which were non-existent anymore and they were depicting them on the walls of the caves and the wall of the cave was considered as a kind of a veil, as a kind of a, of a, of a curtain in between them and the netherworld. And in my opinion, they were depicting these animals in order to send the message to the place where this animal came from, send us more or, or we lack them. This is my view. That there is a prayer in that 
whole experience? Maybe not a prayer, but but a wish. Or, or listen, many many indigenous societies have a concept which is called the master of the animals. They believe that it, that in some place in the underworld of the up of the up of the upper world there is an entity which releases the animals for their use, and they believe that they should treat the animals in respect in order to make sure that this master of animals keep sending them the animals. You can call this master of animal God. You can name it whatever you wish. They call him the master of the animals. And it's not necessarily an animal. It's an entity. And they believe that following their behavior, the master of the animals is sending them, is providing them with what they need. So I believe they went out there to send this this message, this this message, this wish, this this kind of 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 conversation with the entity that is responsible for their prosperity, saying, "This is what we lack. What 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 is going on with that? We we need that. <laughs> we like that. We sustain on that. Uh, this is no longer available. This is what we see in our visions. We know that that." In visions, you see things you are familiar with or you wish to. So I believe this is the connection between the states of consciousness and what is, what is depicted on the walls. It is not necessarily that they saw this while, they're, while, while they, uh, they experienced a state of hypoxia within the cave. But I believe this is what, this is what concerned them. This is what they were used to. This is what they saw in their visions, and this is what they 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 asked uh, uh, the entities in the other worlds. Amazing, amazing. And again, this happens specifically in Europe, where extinction took place at that time. In Israel, for example, there are no cave cave depictions. There are caves. People were living here at the same time, but there are no cave depictions. And I think that the reason for that is that. Uh, animal extinction took place here much before it took place in Europe. So it's not universal. It's a problem that occurred at a specific place at a specific time. And this is why Western Europe is so full of these depictions at this time. But again, maybe this is my wild imagination. <laughs> well, I think, I think it sounds very plausible. Um, I wanted us to shift gears a bit and to talk a bit about the Paleolithic diet. And from your findings, what do you think the prehistoric man uh, existed on? Well, I don't have to think about that. I mean, this is this is quite clear. Prehistoric people existed on whatever was available to them. Uh, prehistoric people had to eat. It was much before 7-Eleven was invented and, and, and other possibilities uh, existed, but the world was an open buffet. Uh, there was a lot available for them, but there were preferences. So I should start by saying that, as I said before, people in the past ate everything they could put their hands on, including everything. Uh, archaeological evidence is biased in favor of uh, animal remains. Animal Animal remains preserved better than plant remains. So we find very little plant remains. It doesn't say that they didn't eat plants as well. They ate plants to some extent. All archaeological sites of the last three million years are full with bones of animals. So there's no argument that animals were the major source of calories for humans. Plant material was supplementary to that. No doubt, but again, to a certain uh, extent only. We are again working under the, un, under the, under the assumption that stone tools were used mostly in order to process animal, animal carcasses, in order to extract calories from animal carcasses. And we have a lot of evidence from stone tools, which remain some of the residue and use signs, and we can show and we have shown and this was published in very good journals, that most stone tools were used to process animals. So we believe that most of the calories that people gained in the past were from animal sources, uh, from meat, but mostly from fat. We believe that fat, animal fat, was a major source of calories for humans throughout time. And why fat and not the meat? First, some people say that fat is tasty. 
<laughs> I would agree. Uh, uh, fat is the densest energy source in nature. One gram of fat provides nine calories, while one gram of protein or one gram of carbohydrates provides only four calories. So it, it is the double, double amount of calories and fat can be, can be digested almost without any cost while protein and carbohydrates are costly in digestion. So there's, there are benefits to fat. Carbohydrates plants before plant domestication, which took place only 10,000 years ago, which is yesterday in my perspective, before plant domestication, plants were not uh, readily available for people in the way we know it now. Uh, the species were very different than the species that we use today. And they were under great demand by other animal taxa, which eat plants. And we were not first in the chain for that. So plants were not were available, but not in the way that we experience it now. Animals were available in huge quantities in the past, and people were hunting. We have evidence for, for hunting for, for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, people uh, uh, were active in the past. They were not sitting in front of the laptops or using the cell phones. They were active. They needed, according to many people's estimation, between four and 5,000 calories a day which is a lot. And you cannot get these calories out, out, of, out of the carbohydrates or fruit that were available to them. So the only solution is uh, uh, eating meat and fat. And again, fat, as I said, is, is the priority. Indigenous societies today are crazy about fat. They crave fat the most. Uh, uh, protein as well. On top of that, the human body, mostly the human liver, poses challenges on the amount of protein that we can digest. We can digest on average only one third of the calories we need a day from protein. We cannot eat a, a meat without fat and survive. We need to combine fat with meat. So we have evidence that prehistoric people were after fat. They were correct. They were cracking every piece of bone in order to extract the marrow. They were looking for internal organs which are rich in fat. So we believe that there are evidence that, that fat made us human. And fat enabled us to sustain our large brain. So from your findings, this very much supports this uh, new paleo diet that's emerged. This idea of... Well, well it's a... It's a it's a complicated issue because they they hunted the game that they ate. They knew these animals very well. They were living together with these animals. As I said, they paid them respect. It, it's, a, it's a different set of relationships. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I believe that a, a human existence was based on eating meat and fat. But this meat and fat is very different than, than the meat and fat that we are eating. And again... Their diet or their uh, 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 their their subsistence was based on a different set of relationships. We go to the butcher and we buy the meat. It was totally different. They were familiar with the animals that they hunted and ate. They treated them with respect. I'm not sure that we treat with respect the steak that we eat. Right. And, they, these and are not industrially farmed animals that they were eating. Not industrially farmed. These were animals that they knew, that they were familiar with, that they had relationship with, that they hunted, had, hunted themselves. And they were able of calculating the right behavior towards these, these animals. For example, I believe that they hunted elephants in the past, but I believe they hunted a single elephant, maybe once in six months, they were not hunting it as a sport. And, and they knew how to sustain themselves again to a limit. At some stage, they pushed the limit, but it took hundreds of thousands of years for that to happen. So, yes, they were eating meat and fat, mostly fat, and supplemented by meat and plants whenever, whenever, uh, available to them but again it was it was a part of a relationship it was not only food right there's been this movement um more in america i've seen this 
where people are hunting more and more and eating what they're hunting. And I, I saw someone, uh, you know, write like a post about this and say hunting is vegan in the sense that there's something a lot more um, a lot more respectful, like you said, about this kind of relationship. And instead of going to the butcher shop and, uh, you know, picking up your industrially farmed meat and not thinking twice about it, this is uh, a completely different relationship where you have seen this animal and, you know, you you have the chance to pay it respect and nothing goes to waste, right? And this feeds your family and your friends and... Um, it's, it's a little, it's a little different, uh, way of thinking of things and it might not agree with our modern sensibilities, uh, but the, the, there is this movement that exists. Well, now. again, uh, uh, there's no way back and, and modern hunters cannot get to the state of mind of prehistoric people that were really in a, in a different, different connections with the world that we're living in. So I'm not in favor of, of, of hunting animals uh, in, in any way today. And, and I don't know what would be the solution for that. But, but there's no way at the moment of restoring this set of relationships. I agree that there's, there's, there's a difference if you, if you hunt your, your own game and you pay respect to that and so on. But again, it's only part of the very wide a set of connections that prehistoric people had with animals and not only with animals in the past. So, so uh, uh, unless it, things will change, will change dramatically and the, and the awareness will be different. Uh, I see no uh, way of paralleling here with, with, with hunters in the past and hunters in the present. Right. Uh, it's not, maybe it's, I'm doing wrong to some of the modern hunters, but, but again, this is, this is my view. No, it's it's definitely hard to replicate the kind of experience and connection that they had to the cosmos around them. Absolutely. And again, uh, nowadays it is possible to be vegan. In the past it was not possible. You will not survive if you were vegan. As 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 sad as it it might be for for people who are vegan today, but in the past there were n not so much possibilities that that are available now and 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 no one was vegan in prehistoric times. <laughs> I'm sorry. So let me ask you, um, if you were giving advice to someone who is looking to become an archaeologist, what advice would you give them? Wow. Uh, uh, first of all, many people send their kids to me in hope that I will tell them to go to study in university. And this is not what I do. I try to understand what, what, what their heart is telling them. So I think that the people f should, should find something that, that makes them feel good and they are good at doing that. So this is the only advice I can give. I mean, I mean, there should be some kind of an interest, but if someone wants to be an archaeologist, he or she uh, uh, needs to follow, follow a combination of their heart and their mind. It should be a combination of both. If you want, if you want it to be done properly. I mean, only mind wise, it can work, but to some extent. Only heart wise, it can work, but to some extent. It should be a combination of, 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 of a logic and a feeling. And, 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 uh, uh, once this works, I mean, once you work, in tandem with your brain and your heart, this is the perfect solution. And, and this is easily, easily noticeable. I mean, one, one should, should feel that it can take time, but, but at least in archaeology, it's very easy. It's very easy. Uh, one had to, to, to have a set of, of, of qualities that will allow him or her to enjoy both field work and lab work. Again, it's a combination of two. But but again, the combination of the mind and the heart is 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 really important. Beautiful. And if our listeners today were to take one message away from our conversation, what would you want it to be? Well, uh, first that that that, uh, uh, that the past is the is the source of 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 our knowledge, and we should look to the past in order to understand 
where we stand, because where we stand now is a consequence of what happened to the human race in the past. Everything we think is about human nature is not human nature. It's human practicing uh, all kinds of adaptations in the past. So the way we, we perceived ourselves now could be understood if we look to the past. So the past is, is, is a portal to understand our present. And there are very... Uh, 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 important lessons as we as we discussed today that could be taken from the past and again uh, uh, if I should uh, choose one it's respectful behavior towards everything amazing amazing thank you so much for speaking with us today my pleasure thank you for listening for everyone out there listening thank you for tuning in to the bigger picture I hope you found this conversation interesting. You can find us on all podcasting platforms, wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to hit subscribe to stay up to date with the latest episodes. My name is Romy Firon. This is The Bigger Picture. Thank you for listening. Till next time.